the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Welcome to the podcast on Tuesday, the 9th of March, 2021. On the podcast today, Robert Lyon, Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel at Arix Bioscience discusses their final results with their net Asset value of increased from 149 pence per share to 242 during the period. Also on the podcast, Harvey Sinclair, CEO of E Energy, summarizes their interim results, which saw revenue increase by 245%. And Glenn Goodman, former ITV News business correspondent, and now the author of The Crypto Trader, talks about Meghan and Harry. Yeah, we got sucked into it. Uh, non fungible tokens and Bitcoin also. Plus, at the end of the podcast, I have, as always, two lists for you. The top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours and the top five most read RNSs. You can check out both these lists at voxmarkets.co.uk. We'll see lots of other content. In fact, there's an article there on Eric's Biosciences. One on, uh, is it, in fact, it's a Q&A with me and Blue Star Capital. New CEO Derek Liu. Uh, plus there's a, an article on Avacta Group. Uh, what else there? Shield Therapeutics. Lots of stuff there, all written up by Fran. Check that out. And uh, our COVID-19 index, always like checking that out. Biggest rise of the day is uh, Hemogenix Pharmaceuticals, up 12.7% to 6.65. Biggest faller is Tech Capital. Had a big rise yesterday, though. It's down 9% to 16 pence. Check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK-listed company. Offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data, and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk. .co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now is Robert Lyon, Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel for Arix Bioscience. That's A R I X ticker. Rob, thanks for joining me. Great to be here, Justin. Thanks for having me. Yes, and you've got your results out. Impressive set of results. There, we we'll go through them in a bit. We'll dig into the figures and all that stuff and uh, what, what to look out for in the coming months. Before we do that, uh, Robert, for people not familiar with Arix Bioscience, could you just give a, a brief summary as to what the company's about, please? Sure. So, Arix is a transatlantic biotechnology venture capital firm. We're headquartered and listed here in London on the Stock Exchange. Our business is building and investing in the most exciting life science opportunities that we see in Europe and North America. To date, we've got a diversified portfolio of these businesses, and they're developing new treatments for patients in areas of high-end need. This has the potential to deliver transformational results for the patients and also superior financial returns for us as an investor. Excellent stuff. Okay, like I said, uh, good results out, uh, impressive figures there. Could you just give us uh, some key headline numbers, Robert, please? Absolutely. So 2020 was obviously a very strong year for us. Our net asset value over the year increased by 62%. Mm. So that went up from 202 million at the end of 2019 to 328 million at the end of 2020. That's equal to £2.42 per share. During the year, we also realised 158 million of cash. So this was primarily driven by the landmark exit of Velos Bio, which returned 139 million of cash to our balance sheet. This return has helped drive the internal rate of return on the portfolio since its inception in 2016 to 32%. It's also left us with 174 million of cash on the balance sheet at year end. Wow, that's going very well. And you mentioned that the acquisition of Velos Bio, undoubtedly the highlight of 2020, and you mentioned there it returned 139 million of proceeds to Arix. So how much did you originally invest in that company then, Rob? So originally it was just under £12 million, and we did that in two rounds. So we led the Series A into Velos in October 2018, but then also invested further capital in the Series B in June 2020. Mm. Um, as you say, it was sold at the end of last year, and it was sold to Merck for $2.75 billion in cash all up front. So that exit turned our original £12 million investment into £139 million of cash, as we say. Um, that's a 12 times multiple return on our money in just over two years. Nice. And Velos' proceeds uh, significantly increase in Arix's capital pool. Can you expand on the, on, the, on the use of the proceeds and how much capital is committed to the current portfolio, Rob? So, absolutely. As mentioned earlier, we've got 174 million of cash on the balance sheet at year end. Now, of this, we've committed £9 million to existing portfolio companies, and that'll get drawn down over time if they meet pre-agreed milestones. 
We've also reserved a further £35 million, pounds, and that's to support existing companies that we're already invested in, where we anticipate there may be future financing needs. However, um, as you can do the calculation, this still leaves a very substantial cash pile, which enables us to provide flexible long-term investment to new investment opportunities. Um, this privileged position also has a great advantage in making us a very attractive investor, and that is evidenced by the very strong pipeline of opportunities that we're continuing to see. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you've significantly uh, reduced o- OPEX. Uh, can you recap the OPEX for 2020 and the annual run rate for 2021 and beyond, please, Rob? Absolutely. So, as you say, there's been significant reductions in OPEX over the last year. It was running at £8 million on a net basis in 2019. In 2020, we got that down to £7 million on a net basis, although that did include several one-off exceptional items. Going forward in 2020, we're now then looking at a net run rate of less than £5 million. Um, given our current NAV, this works out about 1.5% of NAV. Going forward, we do expect there may be some increase in the cost base as we build out the business to take advantage of the VELOS proceeds, but we're committing to keep this cost base below 2% of our net asset value. Understood. Okay, and outside uh, VELOS Bio, what were the other sort of key portfolio highlights uh, of 2020? Well, there were quite a lot of successful um, progress in the portfolio from a number of companies in 2020. Uh, key ones I'd bring out are Harpoon, which is a NASDAQ-listed oncology company. They've now got four programs in clinical trials, and there's encouraging early data in their lead programs. Uh, another highlight would be Arteos, which is another oncology company. Um, that's earlier, but has now moved into the clinical stage. We're the biggest shareholder in Arteos, and we're very excited about the potential in that business. Um, Another key progress was seen in Atox Bio. That's a later stage company. And so it's actually reported final data from its stage three pivotal trial. Um, Atox is developing a treatment for necrotizing soft tissue infection, which is a very nasty infection. And um, one of the reasons we're very excited, we know patients are very excited, is that Atox's drug will be the first treatment for this infection if it's approved. They've managed to move forward and submit an application for approval to the FDA in the US, and we're expecting a decision on that by September this year. And then more broadly, the portfolio collectively raised over half a billion dollars in fresh capital in 2020. So that leaves all of our companies well funded to develop their programs and reach potential value inflection points during the period. As well as this progress within the existing portfolio, we were also very excited to add a new company to the portfolio, 12Bio. So this is a Denmark-based gene editing company that we've founded and funded. Um, It's run by Christian Schetter, our managing director, as the chairman, and we have a 49% stake in this business. Okay, cool. And um, can you tell us uh, some of the key catalysts to look out for in 2021? Certainly. So we've got across the portfolio 21 clinical trials that are expected to read out this year. So there's multiple opportunities for key catalysts to come through. Um, Ones I'd highlight are are Harpoon, as I said. They've got um, multiple trials reading out and there are actually four phase one, two trials in a variety of oncology indications that we're awaiting data on. Um, Imara, which is another one of our largest holdings, is also going to have a key trial readout later this year. That's phase 2B data um, for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, um, and we're awaiting that with uh, keenness. Um, another key point, as I've already noted, is Atox Bio. So September this year, we're mm-hmm. expecting the FDA decision on approval for their lead indication and the drug for treating necrotizing soft tissue infection, which will be um, a very exciting moment for us, the company, and for patients. Yeah. Um, as well as these exist trials. It's worth noting, of course, there are going to be new trials that are going to be initiated during the period. So Logic, Bio and RT also both moving into the clinic during the year. Um, and although it will then take a while for those trials to read out, moving into the clinic is actually a really important stage for these companies. And it's a validation of the hard work and capital that has been deployed into these businesses. Excellent stuff. Okay, Rob, well, listen, every day on the podcast, I highlight the top five most followed companies. Uh, to get on that list, of course, people have to hit that follow button. So if you could, uh, you know, people are liking the sound of this but are not yet following the company, uh, give them three quick reasons why they should hit that follow button and add Eric Biosounds to their watch list, please. Absolutely. Well, firstly, I'd say on a Mac, level, healthcare and life sciences in particular is a great sector to be in. Um, From our perspective, it offers the rare combination of being both a defensive counter-cyclical stock, but also has the potential for really extraordinary returns, as we saw with Velos Bio during the year. 
Um, secondly, I'd say that as well as this focus on delivering superior financial returns for our shareholders, I would remind investors that what we're doing here is deploying capital into the companies that are bringing much needed treatments to patients. Um, this has the potential to dramatically improve their lives and potentially save lives as well. And thirdly, within those two sort of macro points, I'd focus down on Arix ourselves. We offer a really unusual ability for investors to access a diversified portfolio of investments in this sector. We have an expert team that selects and manages these investments, um, and it is available to all types of investors through our public listing, enabling everyone to join us in bringing these treatments to patients and delivering superior returns for investors. Excellent stuff, Rob. Good to chat to you, and hopefully we'll catch up in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much. Great to speak, Justin. Thanks very much. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. And joining me on the podcast right now is Harvey Sinclair, CEO of E-Energy. That's E-A-A-S. Harvey, thanks for joining me. Good morning, Justin. Yeah, and just looking at your results, the six months ended the 31st of December and uh, some really chunky, big sort of you know, double and triple digit percentage gains there. And we'll go through the, the details in a bit. Before we do, uh, Harvey, for people maybe not familiar or not heard of uh, E-Energy, just explain or summarize the company if you could. Sure. Um, so look, E-Energy is a energy services company. Um, principally, we provide energy management um, services to customers and capital-free energy reduction solutions. So what this means is we help customers on their journey to net zero, and we do this through smart green energy procurement um, through our e auction platform, which gives whole of market pricing um, at the lowest cost for green energy. And we deliver energy savings through capital free subscription solutions. And we call that energy efficiency as a service. Currently, that's predominantly through LED lighting, but we're ex- expanding this into other technologies in the coming months through a share of savings model. So we're a climate action business, and we believe that reducing energy waste is the key to the world achieving net zero. And so with our business model delivering energy efficiencies, you know, they're both profitable and risk-free for customers. Um, and we believe that doing nothing shouldn't be an option anymore. Okay, excellent stuff. Let, let's, we'll go through the financial, then operational, then we'll look, look at the outlook as well. So let's start off with some financial highlights, if you could, Harvey. Yeah, great. So look, really strong momentum, um, 245% year-on-year revenue growth, uh, of which 140% was organic. Um, we proved to be generally COVID resilient um, and we've been delivering growth in what's been a challenging market for everybody. Um, We've now delivered our maiden profit before exceptional items. Um, So, you know, 100,000 profit for H1 uh, against a comparable loss of a million in H120, um, which is really good. Obviously, um, you know, we're really seeing strong, strong trajectory growth in the education market. Um, and we're now starting to expand out into the other um, commercial industrial sectors as well. Um, the Beyond acquisition um, that we uh, closed in December uh, is being integrated extremely well. Um, and as you know, we, we, we secured committed project funding facilities um, in the last six months with Suzy Partners. So we, we're seeing margin improvements um, of 450 basis points. Um, so gross margin is up now 30 to 37 mm-hmm. percent. Um, we're seeing um, adjusted EBITDA now for the operating business at 0.4. Um, so yeah, we're really strong growth. Uh, 111 projects installed, um, comparable, which is up 100 percent on the previous um, half year period. So generally, I'm very pleased with all the business units all reporting positive operating EBITDA now. Yeah, absolutely. And if you could sort of highlight some of the, the operational highlights, Arby, what would they be? I would say the um, the operational highlights um, for the eLight group of businesses is that they are now integrated under a single operating platform. So through our, um, our new supply chain agreements where we have our own branded products through Venture Lighting, we're able to provide project economics that are uh, market leading and at a price which um, really is, um, you know, uh, leading in the market. So with with our operating model now, we've got scalability. Um, We've seen uh, integration of the first acquisition RSL that we did um, back in the summer, way ahead of performance now, strong retention of our customers um, across those um, those various subdivisions of eLight. Uh, and probably the other operating highlight for Eli is the growth of the Northern Irish business. So really strong, strong growth there. And then moving over to our energy management division, which is predominantly beyond, um, I would say, you know, 
seamless integration since acquisition in December, um, strong operating model efficiency starting to come through where we're starting to use automation and technology to drive efficiencies and scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you've, you've, you know, two acquisitions in the period there. Are you still looking around? Is there more to come? Yeah, look, we've got a very strong accelerated um, acquisition pipeline. We are um, you know, very, very focused on ensuring that the business is stable before we um, progress with any more acquisitions. But we do intend um, to, to continue on our buy and build strategy. So our goal is to uh, bulk up our customer base through acquisitions in, you know, I guess, synergistic sectors for the beyond business. Um, we are launching a dedicated education product in the energy management space. So focusing on providing schools with a 100% um, green procurement solution um, where we can guarantee to, to beat market pricing from other, uh, other channels using our e-auction platform, which essentially means that suppliers are tendering for schools energy contracts. Um, and th that for us is a really strong initiator of growth. But the acquisition strategy will drive more customers and that allows us to then sell energy reduction solutions into those customers which is proving to be um, you know of, of strong interest to the beyond customers that we've already approached since acquisition earlier this year mm -hmm. yeah and, and at a corporate level I, I, you've, you've bogged up the board as well haven't you yeah look we've hired a great um, chief operating officer uh, Rob Van Leeuwen um, ran the Accenture um, global energy business um, leading technology and um, operations. And so he uh, is responsible for the um, essentially the integration and um, operating platforms for our two businesses and looking at how they come together and looking at how we optimize, I guess, our products and services. So that's doing well. And we've, we've hired Gary Warby, who um, was, you know, founder of um, Energy Quote and a, a strong industry specialist um, with huge amount of experience in the energy management space. So, been a, been a great addition to the board. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you, I assume you're quite confident looking forward now, uh, Harvey, are you? Yes, we are. I mean, the, the schools market has had its own challenges. Um, you know, fortunately, the, 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 the schools are now back operational again. Um, we we can see a very very strong pipeline over the next six months in fact over the next 12 months we've got visibility over you know, strong strong projects that have been you know in investment grade presented to all the decision makers in our pipeline um i think probably schools are distracted right now so we are we are very much focused on working with them within their with their operating constraints making sure that we can get installations um you know, in within holiday periods. Mm -hmm. um, the commercial corporate um, sector is starting to, um, you know, be mobilized again. And I think that is uh, allowing us to expand that pipeline. So, yeah, re really confident about the demand in the market for net zero strategies. Um, we're very focused now on moving out to multi-site projects. So big corporates with multiple sites is a real key focus for us now outside of education. And we think that, you know, that that will pay dividends, um, you know, over the over the coming months and years as we start building out, you know, multiple revenue streams for large customers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely marvelous stuff. Okay, Harvey, as always, then if someone's listening and likes the sound of what you're doing here, the progress you're making, but are not yet following the story, give them three quick reasons why they should hit that follow button and add you to their watch list, please. Sure. So E-Energy is unique. Um, we're a full services energy services company that help companies get to net zero. And we do that through green energy procurement and, you know, essentially delivering energy efficiencies without the need for capital. So we're a strong ESG business on the market with um, high retention rates for our customers. And we believe that as a climate action business, reducing energy waste um, can be profitable for businesses. And we think that the ENG growth story um, has got huge momentum for the future. Excellent stuff. Harvey, good to chat to you. And hopefully we'll catch up in the not too distant future. Thanks very much. Thanks, Justin. All the best. Thank you. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. And joining me on the podcast right now is Glenn Goodman, 
Oh, Glenn, honestly, my leg just gone dead. Glenn Goodman, uh, the author of The Crypto Trader. We just talked about this. Do you know, I've been sitting at a funny angle. My, my foot just, legs out, but one leg over the other, and I cut the circulation off my leg, and it's when my foot went all rubbery, and I was starting to get the, the, the blood back into it. And you said you sit on your legs? I hate guys who do that. Sit in a chair with their legs under there. What are yeah, you doing? Yeah, you accused me of being feminine. Like a girl. The girls well, do that. Yeah, that's a girl. See, that is a girl. That's, that's officially in touch with my feminine side. Yeah, I know, but and I said, stop problem. touching your feminine side. Listen, I, I know <laughs> girls who sit like that. Guys don't sit like that. Why do you do that? And then you said you've got a dead leg sometimes, and the wife asks you, you know, to answer the door, and you collapse on the floor and drag yourself to the front door. And you see the complications here by acting like a girl. It, yeah, it can get complicated. Sit like a man. In an emergency, I'm useless. <laughs> my legs are, just don't work because I've been sitting on them, and the, uh, yeah, all the blood has gone out of them but it's like um why do i do it why do i do it is it because you're small and you can't get up to the desk <laughs> no. sit in your legs surely you've got an adjustable <laughs> chair there claire you can just pop no, the chair up rather that. than use your it's legs it's comfy it's comfy oh, look how comfy it's, girls it's, look it's, it's, right no, i can't you know, do you know what no 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 of a no, girl no. watching a film with her with her boyfriend and they're eating popcorn on the sofa and she has her legs yeah, a girl, up not you she always has her legs up right boys because can't do that because of their bits comfy. no boys it's can't comfy. it's not boys can't do that I, I, do you know what? i'm so unsupple i could never do that would be so uncomfortable for me to do anyway but i just see you now, Glenn. It's yeah. pr- do you know what? I just want to call the interview off. To be honest, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I can't imagine you sitting like a little cat. Uh, that's horrible. Horrible. Uh, I'm all curled up and purring whenever whenever you interview me. I Justin. hate cats as well. I hate them. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm a, more a dog lover. Anyway, and then you went on to say, did you watch the Megan and uh, Harry interview? No. Yes, that's no. what I asked you. No, Are you kidding? What's the point? Of that? I've seen enough of it. Anyway, it's all over the place, isn't it? Uh, is, that, is that all you have to say? Cause <laughs> it's everywhere. I, said, no, I no. said, have you watched the Meghan and Harry interview? And you went, oh, let's let's save this for the podcast. I'm going to start recording. No, because you, you know what? I tell you what. And then you go, no, I haven't seen I, it. No, because so, I went, I tell, I tell you, you why. Down. Yeah, hang on a second. I tell you why. I, went, I just went in the, you know, quickly in the house for a shower. And the missus is there watching GMB uh, from when Piers Morgan walked off this morning and come back on. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, but, uh, I, I Alex, think it's a set up. You know, the Alex the guy was there is right. I think uh, uh, Piers looked like a bit of an idiot, really. Alex um, is obviously uh, you know mixed race there. And um, he did say that, you know, he, he was sticking up. He said, you, you've got a problem with Meghan Markle. He said, you're not racist. You're not racist, but you've got a problem with her because she stood you up. And you've got you've always had a problem with her. And then he, he had a big huff. But um, the missus in there. And I said, no, hang on That's a sec. The weatherman at the place, you know, they work together. They've worked together for years and years. No, I didn't. Like yeah, no, and they're not sort of set up because they're very spiky towards each other. They are a bit spiky. And they've always, they've always had a bit of this. And, and um, Piers was getting stressed yesterday over it because he hates Meghan and everyone was against him and everyone was sticking up for Meghan Markle. And he was getting, you can tell he was really getting under his collar and he didn't like it. Um, but this is what came across to me. First of all, when I saw clips of it, I was on their sides. And do you know what? They've been hassled, bullied, there's racism going on. And now the, my wife was watching it and, she's, and she said, well, the thing is, you know, it could be innocently asked, you know, what is the colour of your baby? Because you are redhead, you are light skinned, but mixed race. What's the colour? That can be innocently asked. If it is racist, fair enough. That's, that's obviously the, the person who said that needs to be outed and kicked out of the royal family, which is a, a farce anyway. We can't have any, you know, an equal society. We've got this odd family sitting at the top there that get riches and everything. Just ridiculous. The, the only reason why the royals are there is because their families, their ancestors, kill ours killed ours and nicked our land better than we did to them that's all and now we champion that so yes they've done very well oh they're they're very to be respected they were killers that's what they were back in the day so that's our society is built on that inequality anyway so it's an you know unequal society but anyway the missus said i said well hang on a sec you know someone said something racist about the baby well no she she, she said well it could have been asked innocently i said okay but what about the uh the the, the titles and prince he said well no one has a title no great grandson or granddaughter has a title that's the way it is. Tradition. You can't have everyone, every hanger on, every great, great, great grandson having a title. So, okay, what about security? So, so, so it's the same law. If you are a great grandson or granddaughter, you don't have security, but your parents do, but you're always with your parents. So what's, you know, so you can see now, Megan put packaged all that together, Megan Markle, and said, Look, he hasn't got a title, he hasn't got security. But that's the tradition. Regardless of where you are, what where you're from, or what colour you are, that's the tradition. And then she said, well, there was, there was some of the colour of the baby. And again... That could be misconstrued, couldn't it? So I don't know where... Yeah, I mean, I watched the interview and it was interesting because, first of all, you had Megan talking and she described, she she kept saying, there were conversations about the baby's race 
and and you know the implication was that was that it was a, con- a concern, I think, was the word that she used, right? But then when Harry later joined in the interview, he sort of comes in as a special guest star later on in the interview, and he was asked about it. The implication from him was that there was only one conversation with one person in his family who we now know was not the Queen and was not uh, Prince Philip, but we don't know who it could have been. But there was one conversation, and it made him feel a bit uncomfortable. But it, it wasn't Prince Philip. It was, it, was, it, was, it was his father, wasn't it? No. Well, well that's no, not confirmed. No, because maybe no, no, because, because, maybe hang on, because, no, because he kept saying he's very hurt by his father. So I'm assuming it's his father. So he's a lot of ground pick up. Uh, but we don't know. But anyway, but the point is, you got a very different feeling from what she said about these yeah. com- these conversations, which made it sound like there was proper discussion about all oh, the baby's race, the baby's race. But then when Harry mentioned it, he 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 only talked about one conversation that made him feel uncomfortable with a family member, and he didn't he didn't refer to the content of it. So we, so he didn't say you know there was concern or anything like that. So what I'm saying, I guess, is she. She, Megan, has only heard it from Harry. She was not involved in in such a conversation, whereas Harry was. So what he's saying obviously rings more true. There was, it seems to me, there was only one conversation, and what was, the, as you say, was it just um, a comment about, oh, we, you know, we haven't had someone with a darker skin before, uh, or was it more sinister than mm, that? Yeah. That is completely unclear. And to be honest, from what Megan said, it's. You know, it sounds like Chinese whispers on her side, and she's reading into it. Chinese whispers, that's racist. Yeah, good point. (laughs) Uh, Let me say one thing. I'd say Oprah, or Oprah, whatever you call it. I'd say, say, if you want to get a balanced view, why don't you interview her family as well? Because, you know, there's this thing has gone on there that uh, she's broken up with that family, she's broken up with the royal family. There's a, there's a common denominator here. I'm not saying it's all of her fault, there's, there's two sides to every argument, but. You know, Oprah's a friend. And of course, topics it, it, were clearly off limit. Before yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that was absolutely clear because otherwise, yeah, yeah. you of course you would go in on asking her about her family and how she betrayed her father and blah blah. You know, when he had a heart attack days before the wedding and she was only concerned about the wedding and not and not her father's heart attack. Mm. You know, that's kind of one of the elephants in the room. Another one is uh, oh, that's how size is now. You're calling you <laughs> elephants in the room. God, and another one, obviously, is these allegations about um, her, Megan, bullying, um, you know, some of the people in her employ, servants leaving because they were so, you know, appalled by her behaviour or whatever. You know, those are just the allegations again, but they were officially made. Hang on, how is this related to crypto? <laughs> oh, God, yeah, I forgot about crypto. Yeah, I'm just yeah. too... I'm Glenn, too you're like, you, are, you sit there like a big girl, sitting on your yeah. legs, and you yeah, watch these right ridiculous now. gossip uh, programmes, and uh, for all intents and purposes, <laughs> you, you may as well be wearing a nightie, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, put it this way, me and my wife have never been closer than in the past sort of 12 hours or so, yeah, just yeah. nattering like a couple of ladies, Sh- non-stop. Sh- about, yeah, sharing uh, clothes about, and food programmes. Right, uh, let's, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about the crypto there, what's happening in the crypto right. space. Are you, are, are you into uh, NFTs at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm well not into them. I know about them, obviously, and I'm very interested in the idea of them. Um, I for bought the uninitiated. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. You you bought an NFT, did you? Yeah, you yeah. I bought, I bought the uh, Kings of Leon album. Uh, I don't know where it's gone though. <laughs> I bought it through MetaMask <laughs> on Open <laughs> Open Sea, which is the biggest uh, apparently uh, NFT website. I bought it there. I got the um the, the, the price I paid for it for NFT for a Kings of Leon album. This is non-fungible tokens, by the way. Uh, again, a bit of a, you know, bit, bit, bit excitable people are about it because they're earning lots of money. Uh, but generally, what I said to I mean, Alan Green, the guest yesterday, I said, when you get getting early on something, it's generally a good thing, isn't it? Even if Bitcoin, you know, I didn't know. I always said, uh, I wish I'd bought someone. It was $600, but I didn't know how to buy it. And I thought $600 is a lot. I don't want to spend yeah, that. But the thing is, because so many people have got the same idea as you, that, oh, let's get in on the latest new thing, uh, the prices it of works. these NFT artworks have gone into the millions already, like within five minutes. Um 
yeah, for the uninitiated, I need to explain what NFTs are. And and don't feel bad about being uninitiated because virtually nobody had heard of NFTs even like a few weeks ago, right? Now suddenly they're they're the biggest thing in the tech industry. Suddenly, uh, so so NFTs are a t- non as Justin said non fungible token. Uh, it's a type of sort of crypto token uh, that I mean essentially it's a piece of computer programming like every every cryptocurrency is a piece of computer program some some code and what they do is you can take an artwork or a piece of music or, or basically pretty much any data and then encode it into this token form and then the token can be exchanged with other people you can sell it to somebody and then they can sell it to somebody so you know you're probably sitting there listening to this podcast and already thinking oh okay so you can you can basically uh, get get pretty much anything and then attach a value to it with code and then send it to anybody it's perfect for collectibles you might be thinking that is its sort of main application so you know you have for example think of like pokemon cards or something like that imagine that each pokemon card instead of selling it as a physical card it's just a piece of code uh, attached to an nft and you can buy and sell it and different values can be attached to it and you know kids can swap these these digital pictures around the world so that's kind of how it started there was a famous thing called crypto kitties well there still is crypto kitties it was invented actually during the last um boom the last uh, cryptocurrency boom in 2017 and crypto kitties are pretty little uh, cartoons of kittens and cats like funny ones uh, clever ones and uh, people would swap them with each other and sell them to each other you know like any kind of collectible market uh mm. the only difference being of course None of it is physical. Now, why NFTs have suddenly blown up is because the auction houses got interested. Christie's got interested. And um, there's a guy uh, whose name escapes me temporarily. I follow him on Twitter. Let's see if I can find one of his tweets. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. He's, he's basically the kind of top uh, NFT artist whose name escapes me. And uh, in recent months, he's been selling his digital artworks for millions and millions of dollars, right? And the interesting thing about this is that people are paying millions of dollars for these artworks, even though anybody can see these artworks, mm. right? Because, you know, he creates a clever digital, basically, he does like political satire. So he'll create a funny cartoon of Donald Trump naked or something, which is what he does. Yeah. And, that was uh, over 6.6 million, wasn't it? It was really ridiculous. Something that like that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He sold each of his artwork sells for millions now. And but the thing is, as I say, anybody can see it. So all you get for paying those millions of dollars is a little email saying you own. Can you hide it, though? Can you hide it? Download it and hide it. Because it's all over the Internet. And and what's more at the moment, they're sort of they make them public uh, sort of automatically. So, you know, for the artist, for example, has all these things on his website anyway. Okay, so hang on. So I've got this. I've just found it, right? So I've got. The, I've got now um, for about a hundred dollars, which is not cheap. I've got a digital album download, limited edition NFT golden eye vinyl, and yeah. a digital collectible album artwork. Um, so I can go to uh, yellowheart.io uh, chain information. So and then you go there, and it says right. It says redeem. Connect to MetaMask, which I've done. Redeem your NFT yourself. And it says redeem tokens. And I, I got the address. Where did I get my address from? I have no idea how to work this out, but I don't, I don't know how to get this. Um, what's my address? Contact address. Oh, there we are. Contract address. Oh, yeah, that's it, isn't it? So I suppose I do that. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, and redeem it. So and then well, I get the album, I get some artwork, but then it's always available, is it? Or what? But uh, I, I just thought it's worth doing for that they are the first in music artist to reduce, uh, to, you know, to release an album. How much did it cost you? Yeah, $100. Hundred dollars. Do you know what That's though? Good. Do you know what though? Do you know what the funny thing was? It didn't cost me. It didn't cost me. I I had uh, a bit of crypto in my wallet somewhere, and I you know when I first started messing around seriously with Bitcoin when we first started talking about it, in fact, pretty yeah. before that, a couple of years back. Um, then I still had some change. I, I, I just reactivated my Bitcoin wallet. I had like uh, I had that that money in my wallets already. 
So I thought, oh, hang on, I, 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 I'd invest in uh, Ethereum, and uh, only a tiny bit. I'd sold most of it, and I didn't sell the rest of it because it wasn't worth it, but it, it's gone up to about $100. So I thought, oh, hang on, I'll just buy the album with that. So, um, so it hasn't really cost me anything, you know. I, it's, it's Why does it say $50 on, on the newspaper articles about it? It then? does, $50, and then there's gas fees and all that rubbish, and then you get the, oh, right. and, and that's the album on its own, but I've got artwork as well, and I've got something else as well with it, so I don't know what else. Uh, and how limited is it? Yeah, they're, they're only doing it for two weeks. I don't know. I mean, people oh, will do right. it by so then, so. any number of them, but for two yeah. weeks. Yeah, okay, exactly. So. I thought that. I thought, well, we'll just put a number on it. So you, <laughs> there might be quite a lot of them. It might not be as limited as you're hoping. But, yeah. but nonetheless, I can understand why, you know, as you say, if it's the first ever music related sort of or big music related sale of that kind, then yeah. it could could have historical value to people like like the time. About a decade ago, when I bought um, a thousand trillion uh, dollar note uh, of Zimbabwean currency, you remember when they had the hyperinflation yeah. and um, and their prices went crazy. So I just hopped on eBay and bought a bunch of their banknotes, including a one thousand trillion dollar note mint sent over to me, and it only cost a couple of quid. And now I, I looked it up, and it's worth a lot more than that. Oh yes, because you so, what? How much? And I wish I'd bought tons of them because it only cost me like two quid or something so i should have bought you know 50 of them <laughs> instead of you, one how much do you uh, how much are they worth now uh let me let me double check you, well you bought a million dollar note you said from that no you're not listening one thousand trillion I'm trying to redeem dollar. my thing oh, one thousand, one thousand trillion, trillion, dollar, trillion yeah. dollar note uh hold on here we go Oh, sorry, one hundred trillion dollar, not one thousand trillion dollar. My mistake. They never went up to one thousand trillion. Where was this, Uganda? Right, one hundred trillion dollar note. Here you Zimbabwe. go. Zimbabwe. They sell them. Um, the collector, the 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 you know the auctioneer type people sell them for one hundred and twenty five uh, quid now. Wow. So, and I only bought one of them. If, mm. if only I'd bought a lot more. <laughs> that, that's a hundred bagger. Wow, it's amazing. That's more yeah. Than... Why didn't I think to buy more at the time? But yeah, anyway. But if you bought more, though, people would have thought you were insane to <laughs> say I'm buying these. Is it, is it, what do you say? Zimbabwe, is it? Yeah, Zimbabwe yeah, and I'm, 100. I'm, I'm going long Zimbabwe. Yeah. But if someone said, I'm just spent, you know, 100 grand on Zimbabwe notes, people say, are you nuts or what? <laughs> They're only going to go down in value, surely. But uh, who would have thought they would go up in value? 100 you know? quid everywhere. And, oh, I could have made so much money. Mm. Anyway, but anyway, back to NFTs. Mm. Point is. Um, yeah, in the past few weeks, it's become clear what NFT is being used for. It's uh, it's being used by rich people partly to exploit people who aren't quite so rich, it seems to be. So, OK, all right. Maybe that's a, a, a bit of an unfair allegation. But you've got uh, people like Grimes, you know, that's Elon Musk's mm. girlfriend, right? Yeah. So she's in a pretty powerful position in this world. She She's a music artist, right? She makes music. And yet she has created 10 digital artworks and then sold them for nearly $400,000. Uh, know, they just, they're just online artworks, digital artworks. So she got on it straight away. And some people have paid her enormous sums of money. This is Elon Musk's yeah, Mrs. Girlfriend. I know. Well, well, it it kind of makes yeah. it's, it's all a bit kind of grimy. Yeah, well, she's grimy, but why has she done that? Though it's not, it's not like you know you could sell a couple of shares as all if she wanted that, you know. But um, yeah, he's one of the richest guys in the world. She's trying to earn a couple of quid selling that nonsense. I don't understand. Anyway, I just I did this experiment. I thought, never know. I, you know, I probably won't even listen to the album to be honest. But uh, you know, probably who not. knows. Uh, but anyway, though, I should I should mention there is a serious point to all of this. You know, what what is what are NFTs for? Is it just a bit of silliness or is it going to be an important thing in the future? I think it will be an important thing in the future. Why? Because it allows people to very, very simply attach copyright to something. Right. Because at the moment. All right. Well, I say very, very simply at the moment, all you have to do to claim copyright on something is literally write the word, the letter C in in a little round circle and mm. copyright next to whatever it is you've created, whether it's a piece of music or a piece of artwork or whatever. You just write copyright next to it and it is copyrighted. But the problem is that it's very hard to establish who copyrighted something first in many cases. You know, like two people might create the same thing or something very similar to each other. And then who, you know, then you have to take it to court 
court who came up with this first. The brilliant thing about NFTs, of course, is because it's all encoded, everything is time stamped, everything is official. And so and so there are websites where you can very, very simply and quickly uh, create an NFT token that is attached to your piece of artwork or your piece of music. And it's time stamped. And it's absolutely, you know, incontrovertible that you're the one who created this thing here. So you can imagine if that is rolled out across the planet, it could be a very big deal indeed. Yeah, I don't know how to get this album. I don't know. I, I've, I've discovered it. I've got it. I bought it. I've got it in my profile on, um, on OpenSea. It's there. And you click on that. And then I go, I did it. I'm there. Uh, open. I have to go there. Yeah, I don't know if I'll redeem it. I don't know. I gotta... Ah, don't worry. There'll be an app one day which will make it easier. <laughs> they just haven't invented that yet. Oh, so. on levels, editions is a uh, sorry. This is um, edition. So I got three thousand. There's three thousand four hundred of them. That's all. Is that all? Yeah. That's how many have been sold so far. Well, that's apparently, I'm surprised. It says it all. It says here is levels edition three thousand one hundred eighteen of three thousand four hundred nine. So, uh, and that I wonder if that's the total that have been sold. That sounds remarkably low for Kings of Leon. Well, they're only in 3,400, so uh, yeah, but they're Kings of Leon, you know, you'd expect, I don't know. Well, I'll hold it there at I'll least just, a few tens of thousands to be sold. I'll just set it on. I don't know, I don't really want it. Uh, okay, cool, marvelous. Uh, let's talk about um, uh, Bitcoin and all that stuff. What's happening there? Anything, any? Yeah, yeah, Bitcoin. Sure. Um, I put out a tweet yesterday. Oh, did you? Tweet. Did everyone? Uh, did uh, and timely and tweet. Did that? Um, did that nick the headlines from Meghan Markle? Your tweet. Did it? Did it, it, <laughs> it did. It did. At least among the the few dozen people who uh, who liked it and retweeted it, uh, because I said. Not, I said, this isn't the loveliest BTC setup I've ever seen, but it could possibly break out. So I just thought I'd let you know. Yeah, this is, this is yeah, exactly the same well, as the last breakout, isn't it? If you look down, it's almost a mirror yeah. image of the last one where it rolled down, went down. It was, it was cup and handle sort of formation. You come around and then they Similar, had one yeah. big day where it went up by twenty percent and then created new highs. But that if it breaks up again like that, you could. You could well, it did. Yeah. I was right. I was proven right, Justin. No, I know. No, it hasn't, it hasn't broken above that top. It hasn't broken above the previous high. What I'm no, about no, no. But it's broken above. If you look at the line that I drew on the chart in my... Oh, um, lines. I said, lines. look, here's the BTC setup. Well, it worked, didn't it? Here's the resistance line. I said it could break out above that resistance line. And what happened? It broke out above the resistance line. The end. So, yeah. you know, what more do you want from me? If you'd, If you'd... Followed that tweet yesterday that I wrote there. What? what you, that's a, that's a four-hour chart. Well, you, I don't look at four-hour charts. Yeah, if you paid a, you have to. Stupid with, with cryptocurrencies. Ridiculous. You if you use daily, you charts, sitting you on your legs yeah. doing four-hour charts. Four-hour oh. charts are important. In cryptocurrency things move so quickly that four-hour charts are kind of like the equivalent of daily charts for stocks and shares. Anyway, so there I was. I drew my little horizontal line, resistance line. I said there could be a breakout above this. There has been a breakout above this, and if you had acted upon my my tweet, Justin, you, you would now pound. be richer than Croesus. You'd be the richest man in the in the podcast world, Justin. Well, it's gone from fifty two to fifty four. How much? Yeah, how much you put, to, uh, yeah, how you'd much have to, had to put a few million quid, say, <laughs> on yeah. on it, and you'd have made. Like, so a if bit you go of back money. to if you go back to a daily now, though, if you got a daily, right? I mean, what I'm looking at is almost exactly the same kind of chart on a daily that it did when it when it hit forty thousand. Right, mm. it's a set, and, and then it came back down, down to thirty thousand, and then all of a sudden it rolled around, then broke up again above forty thousand. Yeah, that, and that one million. big strong day went up there, and so you're thinking, if that's going to happen again, it's set up again where it gets to say fifty-seven thousand and breaks up, that'll be a. Oof, well, I, mean, I can't see going hundred thousand. Well, I did say fifty thousand last time, but of course I'm just guessing the numbers here. But uh, where's it going? Where is Bitcoin going, everyone? Just up, man. You know, this is why I trade trends, because you, the, the beautiful thing about trends is it's they tend trend, to persist. Yeah, but, yeah, trends long. tend to persist. That is yeah, yeah. how it's been people for like ages. make their money. I know. It's persisted for ages, so I've made lots of money, but and now it's um, still but persisting. You, you've sold them you, several times. Uh, been, well, I've been in and out a few times, but ultimately I've just followed this trend upwards. I mean, yeah, it was, it was kind of pretty much it. It was me being timid sort of selling and then getting back in and selling and getting back in. But overall, I haven't really lost by doing that. Well, I've lost time and ha I've had hassle, which I needn't have had because I could have just stuck with the buy that I did at, what was it, about 9,000. 
and just stuck with it until now and uh, not made any effort and and it would have come to the same thing. Didn't you originally yeah. buy it nine dollars or something? No, no, did you no. Buy I, it? I, well, I didn't hadn't even heard of Bitcoin back when it was down there. Well, where, where, where did you first buy oh. it? Eight hundred dollars. Well, I it? bought it first. Yeah, something like that back in what two thousand and fourteen or something when everybody was kind of first getting interested in cryptocurrencies and experimenting with uh, buying and selling them. But you know, it wasn't a big deal back then. It was just like a little. Uh, That's Wendigan, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. If you know that it's going to become the biggest thing in the world, yeah. If someone had told me back then, That's why someone you're gonna, credible, get an early and hold. Told me back then, this is going to be the biggest thing ever. It's going to be worth a trillion dollars shortly. Then obviously, I would have mortgaged my house, put every tiny bit of money into it. And it's the same with you. You'd heard of Bitcoin back then, but were you? I, going, I, I didn't know to buy it. The biggest thing ever. No. I, did, I tried to buy it. I didn't know how to buy it. I find it very hard to buy. Why do I, I buy this? I bought some. You know, it's, it's uh, what is it? Some. If some, you're early, do you know, anything. If you're early, just stick with it. It's like literally. I, I've well, got to. Whatever I've, it is, I've, just stick I've, with it. It doesn't listen, matter what it is. Yeah, no, I've, if you're early on anything, just stick with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can be wrong if you're early because by the time the crowd arrives and checks it out and starts buying, you yeah. have probably several bagged, and then all of a sudden you think, oh, it's not for me, it's not wrong. I did that with a couple of stocks recently. I mean, last couple of years, I go in on a stock that's uh, I'll go blockchain mining, you know, and that was mining Bitcoin. And I, I literally had that at seven pence. Do you know where it is now? I sold out at eight pence. And uh, and um, it's now at two th- two pound thirty seven. Oh, God! Uh, I, I remember this, you talking about. I did, Argo. I did the same. I did the same with um, Paris Energy and things I both researched quite deeply. You know, did videos on and all that. Yeah. And uh, this was at point five pence. I held it's now five point seven. That's another ten bag I missed out. See, this is the problem with that old Wall Street um, phrase. Uh, no one ever went broke by taking a profit. It's true that you don't go actually literally broke by taking a profit, but you do stop yourself, you, or you can stop yourself becoming rich. Yeah. By you only t- need by, one or two of those. Consistently, yeah, yeah. you're never going to become rich by... No, no. You know, no, no. that's why I follow trends. That's what I'm saying, is you follow a trend. No, but listen, listen, hang on, 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 hang on. No, no, but you know what? The only way to become sort of really rich well off is to have something that goes bananas, right? And that you can only do that if you let it run. Yeah. So let it run. But you don't use any sign of a any sign of a of a slight, you know, four hour trend change and you're sitting on your legs, you know, selling off I confess I haven't entirely practiced what I preach when it comes I'm to Bitcoin. I'm the same. I'm, I'm trying to learn from it. I'm the same. I'm, I'm trying to learn from it. It's hard. Yeah, you're right. Try not, that, try, not, try not to have that twitchy finger. That I, I've, I've had that in the past. That's what I'm trying to correct now. I mean, I'm sitting on a couple of stocks that have done you know, a couple of hundred percent. And I'm thinking, I've, I've still seen more in them. I still see more in them. And I'm not going to just sell for a short term. Because if you want to be make a decent, a very decent amount of money, yeah. You've got to have one of those, you know, 50, 60 baggers. And, um, and that's where you just have a bit of balls. And change your change sitting, sitting position, because if you've got balls, you can't sit like that. Yeah. You've got to have balls. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Uh, and this made me feel so much better. Uh, Stephen Goldstein, who's, who's a British guy who's been in the finance industry for decades and, and is now a uh, trading coach, he coaches oh, yeah. coaches traders, and he's damn good. And he's got uh, the Alpha Mind podcast, which is uh, which is also really interesting. Uh, but the point is that he um, he came out with this great phrase on Twitter a few months ago, uh, which was that top traders make all the same mistakes that crappy traders make. It's just that they make them less often. And that really stuck with me because, you know, I beat myself up when I do something stupid like sell Bitcoin just because, as you say, it looks a bit dodgy on a four hour chart. And then I have to get back into it, usually at around about the same price level. But, you know, there's hassle involved. I have to watch the chart for ages to find the right buy point and, and I get stressed and blah, blah, blah. And, and all of that is unnecessary because I should just be following the trend. I know what I should be doing, but my human my human frailties get in the way. But it, that made me feel better because the reason I make money trading and a lot of other people don't is even though I am as frail as anybody else and I make all those same mistakes, I, I'm aware of what the mistakes are and so aware of them that I tend to make them less often because you know often I'll be about to make a mistake and my finger will be hovering over the mistake button and then I'll think, oh no, that's not 
part of the plan. That's not what you're supposed to do. And I sort of stop myself. So that's where experience comes in. It sort of just helps you make those mistakes a bit less often. And that can make a big difference yeah, to your yeah. profitability. Yeah, yeah. But uh, do you know what? Genuinely, um, as an investor, uh, these days now, I'm never going to, uh, well, apart from a left field event, I'm never going to pick a fraud or a, a rubbish company that's going to tank 100% because I do enough due diligence on it. Hopefully, touch wood here, I'm saying this. But even yeah. if I do, I'm diversified enough anyway. You know, not overly diversified because that affects returns as well. Yeah. But to take the hit. And I'll never be yeah. wiped out because I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket, you know. So, um, but yeah, it's things you learn, isn't it? You know, you have to risk and reward. Um, but I've just, you know, one of the most important things I've learned recently, in fact, going back to six months here, is that you can over-diversify and really it affects your returns. You're never going to get make decent money if you've got more than 10 stocks, pretty much, uh, if, yeah. you're, if you're an average private investor. Well, that's why I've I'm done not, this I'm, year with, uh, or last year rather, and still this year with yeah. um, stocks. I've got too many stocks, like I've mentioned on the yeah. podcast a few times. I've still got, I've, I've cut back quite a lot, but I've still got too and many I said, stocks. Generally, you're better off just having a fund and then holding about five stocks. And uh, you can really concentrate on and really do some deep research on and know the risks rather than just trying to, you know, diversify away the risk by having loads because that diversify away the reward as well. So, you know. Uh, yeah, if you I want to be diversified, have a fund. Have, have a, have a, there's an octopus. Which we call, oct, octop, I, I give this example in the video I did for the, my membership club. There's an octopus yeah. microcap fund that does 21% it's done every year for the last since 2007. Now, you can have that sit in the background. It's a nice diversifier. It holds 80-odd stocks. That's, that's excellently diversified. And then you can actually concentrate on a couple of stocks yourself, knowing that's in the background, you know, doing well for you, diversifying for you. So, yeah. Um, there we go. Mm. That's my thoughts, anyway. Um, anyway, yeah, back, to, back to Meghan and Harry. No, sod that. I've had enough of that already. God, I see him all <laughs> over the place. It's just annoying. And I just think it's a ridiculous concept anyway. You know, royal, royal families. It's, 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 it is. And people say, oh, you're anti royalist No, I'm not. I'm just anti-inequality. That's what I'm, I, I am. probably came across as a bit anti-Megan earlier on, but I should point out that the you royal family it. themselves didn't come across too great either. You yeah. know, you, I mean, it's very difficult because you have to do a lot of reading between the lines, obviously. You don't yeah, know oh, how yeah, much yeah, of what you're being that, told yeah, that, is that, true. That, yeah, but nonetheless, yeah. you, you get the distinct impression, first from Princess Diana and now from Megan, that, and, and Fergie as well. You know, you're dealing with a real ossified institution here, aren't you? You're dealing yes. with uh, resistance to change on a, on a grand scale. So, to accept, so, yeah. she's, she's an independent, you know, self-made lady there, you know, very independent, very strong personality. Yes. And uh, part of her probably a bit naive to realise you can walk into the royal family and have your own press and do your own stuff, you know, or, you know, without them saying, no, you can't do that. No, you're part of the royal family. You have to, it's under our umbrella, you know, that we do everything. So it, she, she must have realised that to a certain extent. But uh, anyway, listen, um... Glenda, I think we've, uh, we've, we've okay. We've come back around to this now. It's ridiculous. We should, it's, it's, it's even sort of you know enveloping and in, in, infiltrating our crypto chat. What's going yeah. on here? I know. Even crypto chat isn't yeah. safe anymore. Glenn, thanks a lot, fella, and we'll speak you next week. Okay. Okay. It's time for the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last twenty-four hours. Uh, just come up to the flank there is MGC Pharmaceuticals. Um, talked to those yesterday, of course, at four. Canadian Overseas Petroleum, five, that is, uh, down 5% to 0.357 at four. Napster Group, non mover, seven pence at three. Abingdon Health, down 2% to 96.5 at two. Premier African Minerals, down 6% to uh, 0.185. And then at one, Argo Blockchain, I think they did a fundraise via uh, primary bid, didn't they, last night? Uh, down 4% to 240. Okay, top five most read RSs are as follows. At five, Zoetic International financing agreement with LDA Capital. Um, differ, differing opinions on that uh, agreement, financing agreement. Should, should help them though. Uh, at four, it's open off new contract win with Oxy Biotherapeutics. Therapeutics. At three, Gritland Gold interim results. At two, Gene Dive distribution agreement. And at one, it's a Vacta Group diagnostic licensing deal with BioKit. That's it for the podcast. Thanks for listening. Much us appreciate it. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice, and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.